We have one final argument set for this morning, All Train Inc. versus Director of, the Director of the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services. Case number 29244. Um, and I do see both counsel the rest. So good. Each party will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're going to reserve that time, just let me know and I'll try to advise you. You should also keep track of the time on the television there. We do record our arguments and post them on the court's YouTube channel, so we ask that you do keep your voice up and stay at the podium. And we've read the briefs in this matter and are ready to proceed if you want. May it please the court, my name is Rick Williger. I'm an attorney representing All Trans this morning. And uh, All Trans actually here today represented by Mandy Pugh, who's just, just going to sit and watch and critique. How about the uh, rebuttal time to reserve something? You know, I think I'd like to reserve five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So when you look at that clock and it gets to five, you're in your rebuttal time. Just so you know. Got it. Thank you. This is an unemployment compensation case. Um, it is, uh, I know you've read the briefs, indulge me just for a moment, just so that I can kind of set forth some of the facts that I think are salient, and then I'll get uh, more into my argument. Uh, the gentleman who is receiving the unemployment compensation thing is Brandon Bruder. We tried to get him, but never were able to actually talk with him. He was actually present for the uh, hearing that was held, the telephone hearing. So we do have his testimony by a transcript, and that's part of the record also. Uh, but he's not made an appearance in this court. Uh, the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services granted him unemployment compensation. We uh, appealed that without going into all the boring uh, administrative details of it. Uh, it was denied all the way up. We had a hearing before the um, a telephone hearing before a hearing officer. The hearing officer made a couple of findings of fact. And it's those findings of fact that we are here contesting today. I'm specifically uh, going to hone in on a couple of his findings of fact. And the findings of fact that he made, procedurally, for, forget the procedure because I already went through that, but, but factually what happened was Mr. Magruder admitted uh, in, the, in the course of the hearing that he knew that the rule, there, there was a rule present that says that if you're absent um, or late, or leave early five times in a row within a 12 month period, then your history, you're terminated. Uh, during the course of the hearing, he admitted that he was aware of the rules. He didn't like the rules. He didn't mean to violate them, but he recognized that in fact he did violate them. Is it that clear cut, or don't you have to demonstrate an unreasonable disregard for of uh, your client's best interests? Well, that I think is the issue, um, because the, what I get to here is, I, I don't think there's any question that you have to establish fault. I think Sankus is very clear on that, uh, the Sankus Plakis uh, case. But what I'm objecting to and what I don't think has any place in this is the gloss that the hearing officer put on it requiring misconduct. Because he does say in his findings of fact, misconduct. His findings of fact say, one, there's five instances of tardiness or leaving early in the 12 month period. He admits he said he said that. Two, he recited the five instances, instances, excuse me. He notes the accumulated five instances was in a rolling 12-month period and that he was discharged in accordance with the written policy. So that's not a question either. He says also, quote, while the claimant violated the attendance policy, misconduct has not been shown. And he says misconduct. He doesn't say fault, he says misconduct. And then he says, quite clearly, at a quote, absent misconduct, his discharge is not reasonable. Does the, does the employee manual, I presume, or wherever this rule was written down, does it say somewhere in that rule that misconduct, I mean, that misconduct not to do this? No, um, and the rules are actually in the... Where's he coming up with that? Well, I don't know. That's, that's why we're here. Because I don't think he should come up with it. I don't think misconduct is a proper, is a proper legal um, requirement. Um, there's actually a case on it that's, that says that. Um, and I'm going a little bit out of order here, but I'll, with any luck, I won't derail myself completely. Um, but 
there's a case out of the 10th district that says, I knew I would do this if I derailed myself. Um, I will find that case because I started talking about it. Mo most of these cases that um, that talk about unemployment compensation very rarely actually even mention fault, although fault is certainly a part of it, um, as, uh, as the saying this case makes clear. Let me go back to what I was going to do, and I'll eventually get to the case that talks about no misconduct is not necessary, because I'm just not finding it right this second. Um, well, he, could he be at fault? I mean, he did say he takes full responsibility for being late. Well, I think he was at fault, and I think fault okay, is Okay, let's fight. assume he was at fault, but don't you, again, it's, 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 that's not the end of the inquiry, is it? No, it's not. In fact, there's the, the test set forth by saying this plankus, plankus again um, by the Supreme Court. Um, there's a there's a, a four or five part test, and I'll again I'll find that one and I'll read it to you because I was going to do that in any event. Well, it's in the briefs, I know. It is, um, but it says that uh, there there's it's a four part test. Uh, the employee does not perform the required work, which I think is clear here. He wasn't there. To, perform the required work. Number two, the employer made known its expectations of the employee at the time of hiring. There's no question about that. He knew about the rules and he had missing notes about the rules and the rules are also in the transcript. Three, the expectations were reasonable. I think if you're not at work, it's reasonable to assume that you're not going to retain your employment. And number four, the requirements of the job did not change. And again, during the period of time that he was there, the requirements of the job, the attendance policy did not change. Now so that's a test for what? And that's, well, that's the, um, that's the test as far as, well, the Supreme Court says that that constitutes fault. Uh, because what they say here, again, it's in saying this, that's in paragraph 10. Um, unsuitability for a position constitutes fault sufficient to support a just cause termination. An employer may properly find an employee unsuitable for the required work and thus to be at fault when, and then goes through the four parts that I just read. So I don't think it requires misconduct. I don't think it requires intent. I don't think it requires anything other than exactly what the court says. And when you look at the facts in this case, the facts in this case, as far as the findings of fact go, he collected five instances within a rolling 12-month period. The rule was known to him. The expectations of attendance, I think, are reasonable, per se. And the requirements didn't change during this period. He was therefore at fault. I don't care if he didn't mean it. I don't care if his car went off the road. You know, in, in the course of this case, in the course of the testimony, there was another part of the transcript where he talks about knowing that his job was on the line anyhow before these four, before these five came up. And that's actually in the transcript, um, on page 22 of the transcript, if you, if you refer to it. He says he knows that his job was coming, that he was close to losing his job anyhow. And that was before 2018, before any of these infractions occurred. So coming into 2018, he knows his job is on the line. So this is not a guy who's just all of a sudden late once, or late twice, or late three times, or late five times. This is a guy whose job is on the line and he knows it, and he doesn't do what he needs to do in order to make sure that he gets to his job on time. That's fault. The hearing officer saying that misconduct is required, I think, is, is, is putting a gloss on the statute and a gloss on the case law that does not apply. And when you say fault, are you equating that to just cause? Yes, because I think the court does. I think the Supreme Court does. I think the Supreme Court says, um, if you find fault, you're going to find just cause. Is fault the same as misconduct? I don't think so. I think misconduct's different. I think misconduct implies um, a mens rea, uh, if you will, in the civil civil arena, obviously not criminal arena. I think it implies that um, that there is something that he's doing that causes it, and he knows it, and, and, and or intends the result. But the cases, the cases say you don't have to intend the result. I think that's what the misconduct is, and I think that's what the hearing officer is requiring, and I think it's, I think it's misplaced. 
And during the time that I'm um, listening to, to counsel give his argument, I'm going to find out one case, and I'm going to, <laughs> if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find that site, and I'm going to, and I'm going to give it to you, because I think it's important, because I think there was another court that, like I said, that actually said, um, that actually said what I'm saying. In terms of um, misconduct and in terms of his fault proven by, by giving the four tests, I think there's another case, uh, James McGee versus Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. It's a 10th District Court um, case also that also says that a willful or heedless disregard of duty or violation is not required to satisfy the fault requirement. So again, I, I think we're talking fault versus misconduct, and I think the hearing officer got it wrong. Um, I'm done. Thank you. All right. You'll have five minutes uh, for your rebuttal. Thank you. Counsel, <coughs> 15 minutes for your Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Lawrence Snyder from the Office of Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost. First time I've had to say that. Uh, representing the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. I believe our brief uh, is pretty short. It's pretty straightforward. I think it covers everything I've heard you asking about. Um, briefly, I would say the standard that you were hearing Mr. Williger give you about that was a four-part test from Sangus. That's for an unsuitability discharge. That's not what we're here on. This is a disciplinary discharge. Unsuitability means incapable. You know, you just finally say, I'm sorry, Bob. You, you can't do the math. You know, we're going to have to let you go. That's an unsuitability discharge. And that was those four uh, factors that he was giving me. That is not relevant in this case. This case is a straight-up discharge with or without cause. Um, I do understand the idea that where, where there is a uh, policy in place uh, and it is followed and someone is discharged that the, the first blush you think, well, that's enough. Well, the problem with that is every employer has a different disciplinary policy. That results in similarly situated people being treated differently based on what the disciplinary policy was of that employer. So, to straighten that out, these cases come to the OBGFS, eventually the UCRC, and that is a factor, but this is a factual determination at its heart. That's what this comes down to. So you look, okay, he was discharged. The same thing has happened many times in these cases where an employer does not follow the policy, discharges an individual for one egregious act. Eventually that person is rehired due to either a collective bargaining agreement, court case, etc. That person is not going to get unemployment compensation based on the fact that they were rehired. The case is still pending. It happens all the time. We're going to find what if they, if they, they find the reason they were discharged was just cause, regardless of the fact that it wasn't a violation of the policy, they're not going to get their, their unemployment. It works both ways. So if, giving the test for a discharge similar, that's involved in this this case is it's, uh, it's it's statutory 41 41 29 e2 a uh, discharge with or without if you quit without just cause uh, or if you're discharged with just cause you are not entitled to unemployment compensation at its heart that is a that is a factual consideration that's why they have the hearing that's why you the gentleman, Mr. Magruder, showed up. He testified. He was uh, very sincere. It's a very short transcript. Uh, the hearing officer, in this particular case, found that the uh, disciplinary policy was not, I don't know if you want to say it wasn't applied fairly, but they're not making a ruling on that. All trans are free to discharge any employee they want, any time they want, for any reason they want. That can't dictate whether someone does or does not get unemployment compensation. What dictates that is the particular facts of every situation. In this particular case, they found three of those situations were such that it didn't show disregard for the employer's best interest. This was somebody who wanted to work, who was uh, willing to work, and through circumstances beyond his control, which I believe is what the hearing officer used uh, in the actual findings, uh, wasn't able. Now, he's not entitled to his job back, but they felt under those situations, this is somebody that was ready when that's what 
the fund is for. To, to you know, for 26 weeks, give somebody several hundred dollars to get by. This is just a charge against the account. This is not a direct charge against Altran. This is a fund, a mutualized fund. I don't, it may very well have, I don't even know if the rate or experience rating went, would go up because of this. This is just one situation. I can see the situation where a different hearing officer, me, anyone could look at this and say, well, that's, that was reasonable for them to discharge him. We're not giving him his unemployment. But that's the standard of review. If reasonable people can differ, then the, the case law says we have to affirm. And in this one case, based on this one set of facts, I would argue that this was the correct decision and ask the court to affirm. Unless there's any other questions, I believe I have everything else covered in the brief. And there is a case that Mr. Williger is going to find. And I believe it says that uh, it, 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 I mean, I've literally done this for five years. I have the case right here. Like, I don't know if it's Sangus or, or Irvine. If those are usually the two big cases. But what it says is violation of a specific rule is not in and of itself what we're looking for. And I think it does say we are looking for misconduct. I think it says the opposite of what... Let me ask you a question. Sure. If you're supposed to be someplace at a certain time that you don't show up, isn't that misconduct? It, that implies to me... Uh, uh, level of intent. Misconduct to me, well, misfeasance, malfeasance, it, it implies intent. That I, there are, I'm sorry. Would, wouldn't you intend to be at work? You intend mm -hmm. to be at work. He did intend to be at work. I think that was sort of the determination of the, the hearing officer. It was intent, his intent to get there. Remember, two of these were snowstorms. Uh, some employers do have what they call no fault. Uh, attendance policies, just meaning five absences, we don't care if your car broke down, your mom was in the hospital, you know, you get, and those have all been addressed. We can't, based on who gets unemployment, based on every employee, the employer doesn't get to decide what is or is not fault. The UCRC, ODGFS, gets to decide what or is, is or is not fault. And in this case, again, in this case, I would say eight out of ten of these, go the employer's way. Because there's more, there's more uh, facts. A lot of the cases cited by Mr. Williger, you'll see these people were suspended, you know, three times for three days, and 10 days, and 20 days, and three more. Then they're terminated. Well, obviously, that's a fair, you know, disciplinary policy there. There's another, another one of the cases said the gentleman was tardy, I think, 148 days in two years. That's not this case. Nobody would argue that that wasn't just cause to discharge that gentleman. It's just the facts of this case that make this what it is. I don't think we need to change any laws. Just follow what we have. Any additional questions? Just a fact, ask that you affirm. All right, thank you very much for your presentation as well. And uh, hopefully you only have five minutes left. Thank you. I found it. Um, the, one, the case that I'm referring to, uh, I'm not sure what case uh, counsel is referring to, but the one I'm referring to is Mayorka, M A I O R C A dash Notman, N O T M A N, versus Director of Job Family Services. It is an 11th district case, not a 10th district case. And what's what, the site on? Um, it is, yeah, that would help. 66 Northeast 3rd, 1155. Uh, the case, the court case itself through the court was number 2015-T as in Tom-0122. And what the court says in paragraph 17 is, in determining the existence of just cause to discharge, the employee's conduct need not constitute misconduct, but there must be some showing of fault on the part of the employee. So it's not just me making this stuff up, although sometimes it sounds like it. Um, the court actually says, you know, they're distinguishing fault from misconduct. Just to respond to a couple of things that I heard said, whether or not the experience of this particular employer, the premiums of this employer are going to be affected really isn't uh, of consequence as far as you're concerned. Um, it, it, it's the law. And while we, we understand that the burden uh, or that the, the the reviewing court's charge is to um, 
not look at facts and say, well, I would decide differently. I mean, uh, obviously, you don't want to do that. Nobody wants you to do that. I don't want, I don't want you to say that their factual findings were wrong. Uh, that would be a losing argument anyhow. But you're allowed to look, you're allowed to look at the law and revise the law if you think the law is wrong. And I think the law in this case, uh, as it's been applied up to now, is wrong. I know that you're not reviewing the common police court's ruling, um, but the, com the reason that we appealed it is one of the reasons is the common police court ruling doesn't really say why. Why, why the, why the, uh, the uh, Department of Job and Family Services UCRC was correct, uh, and we don't think that they were. Um, whether or not this gentleman wanted to be at work again, it implies a, 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 an intent that we're really not talking about here. Um, the Plakas case says, uh, the, I mean, the Supreme Court says here that, and I'll quote it again, that, that Hammond, the, the claimant, wished to perform better, cannot obviate the plain fact she could not fulfill the minimum standards. Same thing here. The fact that Magruder wanted to be at work doesn't mean that he made it to work. And as a matter of fact, he didn't make it to work. He knew he was in trouble, and even though he knew he was in trouble, he didn't make it his business to get there. And whether he was late by a minute or a second, or, or five hours, doesn't matter. What matters is that he didn't make the effort to get there when he knew he had to get there and he knew his job was on the line. And to reward that, it's wrong. Um, to say that you have to show misconduct is just a, a, a legal inaccuracy that is, that is reversible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The clerk will take the matter under advisement, issue its decision in due course, and the clerk of courts will mail each of you a copy of the decision once it's released. You can also um, check the Supreme Court of Ohio's website where the opinions are posted. So thank you, gentlemen, for your arguments. Thank you. With that, court will be adjourned.